Let me begin by saying good evening, good evening, good evening. It is another great day to be able to come to the house of to study and share because so many take it or don't recognize that we need to study God's word, that he is supreme and he is all known and he's worthy to be praised. So let me start with this little song here. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down, Lord, since I laid my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down, since I laid my Burdens down, friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Every round goes high and higher since I laid my burdens down. Every round goes high and higher since I laid my burdens down. Let me know for our scripture reading, I'll come out of Second Peter. The third chapter, and um, I'm going to read verses 17 through 18. Ye therefore be loved, seeing ye know these things before. Beware, lest ye also be led away by the error of the wicked. Fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Shall we pray? This evening, our kind Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with thanksgiving our, in our hearts, praises on our lips and worship in our mind. Father, we come this evening to Father this Say, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for everything because we know that regardless of what our troubles may be, our blessings always outnumber our, tr our troubles, and we thank you. Then, Father, we're asking that you be with us as we go through our Bible study this evening. Just touch hearts and minds and speak through me as I prepare to facilitate this lesson. And all those who are listen, listening will get a thought or an enlightenment from the lesson. And Father, I thank you in advance for answering this prayer. Lord, I'm praying it in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Okay. We've been studying the, art, the articles of faith. And we are down to uh, Article 13. And I took some time as we was talking about with the gospel church. And I, we went through that, and this will be the third week we've had on this one, because I took some time to go back and take the church covenant and lay it aside with the responsibilities of the church members. And if we can recognize and for us to get a better understanding of what the church covenant means to each church member. And um, 
I'm going to take a moment here and just kind of reread through this, the article. And then I'll just go over a uh, briefly before we start into the conclusion of what we're talking about. And of the article hey, of the church of the ch gospel church. And this is what uh, the tenets that we live by. And it says, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant and the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinance of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word. That's that it only scriptural officers or bishops or pastors and deacons who qualify, who, who, excuse me, whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle of Timothy and Titus. And let me say this. Uh, and I, for another reason, I took that time to go back and outline church, the basic covenant of the church, because it has four components to it. And it talks about baptism and salvation. We discussed all of that. I'm not going to go back through that. Then it talks about the duties to our members' duties to the church. And a member come into the church, whether it be baptism or can, uh, Christian experience or by letter. They always, when they're taking them in, they, the pastor, the deacon, they say that uh, upon their, what, um, when you've been given the right hand of fellowship, you have all rights and privileges as any other member. And I've come to find out and to learn many members who have been in the church for a long time, and certainly the new ones, doesn't have a, a clue or have a full understanding or what that phrase mean? I have all rights and privileges as other members of the church, of any other member of the church. The first thing said, "Well, I'm in, I'm a, I'm I've been fellowship in now. Well, okay. What is your responsibility to the church? So this is what the church covenant it basically lays it out. And when you have uh, hmm, membership application, it lines itself up with the church covenant. And I thought. And I felt in my heart as the under shepherd of this little branch design to make sure that everybody knows the members, what that when they say I have rights and privileges, and you have a responsibility to the church. You are there to help keep for the upkeep of the church through your finances, through contributing uh, your time, and, and other we went through that last week to uh as, your, as a member of the church. The church don't run on its own. It has to have some support. And the church is supposed to grow numerically, financially, and spiritually. Okay. And that was the one reason I read uh, 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. But my focus was uh, uh, 2 Peter 3 and 18. We grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can't just stay babes in Christ, but all that comes into play as we study, we meditate, and we try and uh, we attend classes, the classes that the, is being offered. And I'm, I'll say this, I have uh, this church and I've paid and authorized the payment of uh, being in the district duties, the uh, district association fee, that gives us, uh, this church, uh, the right to attend all of the classes without the members having to pay an additional fee, okay? And the same thing with this on the state level or on the national level. But many of the, the members don't take advantage of it. Uh, and I keep saying, okay, uh, we are paying the dues for the association, but then in order for, uh, I can't teach it all. I'm doing my best. Um, mission on Monday, Bible study on Tuesday, Sunday school on Sunday morning, and then the service. 
you, you need to kind of get involved. If I made the provision for you to take additional class, you're gonna grow in his knowledge if you study his word. So this is, this is why I took the time and went back through the church covenant because I was talking to church members, okay? I talked to about their basic duties to the church. Then we talked about their duties and personal Christian living. And if anybody has sat in my classes at any point in time, they can, I, they've always heard me say this. If you are a child of God or you are a believer in Christ, you should manifest some of his righteousness as opposed to continuously living like the world. And I use this phrase, looking like Aunt Hagee's children because you are in the world. And that Aunt Hagee is not as a, being a negative, but it's a description of continuing to live worldly. That was my, my point. And so I, um, the reasoning for taking the time to go back through the church covenant as it lays out, as it ties in with uh, the gospel church. And we as members of our church has a duty to the church. And the first one, I'll say this, I'll read the, the to walk together in Christian love. And we have the scriptures to support all everything I'm saying. And we are supposed to strive for the advancement of the church and promote its prosperity and, spirit and spiritually growth. Okay. We are supposed to support its worship, its ordinance and his discipline and his doctrine. Okay, all of that is, is and aligns with uh, what we believe and what is the conduct and activities or activities might be a wrong word, choice of word of the church. And when that we say, uh, when we take that, I'll say oath or pledge. I have all rights and privileges. When you are given that as any other members, yes, you have a right to do this and you have a right, you are uh, in Christ, but you have a responsibility to help support the church. And we'll find that many of them don't always do that. They come to church, uh, show up to the nine, and tell you in a heartbeat, I don't have any money to put into the church. <laughs> well, <laughs> Henry, I know you're laughing, but it is the whole, it is the gospel. I know, church. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> They'll look you eyeball to eyeball and say, I don't have any money to put in church. And then we we'll spent spend $150, $300 on the hat. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm. where, does, where does God come in, in, in as far as their relationship to God? If he doesn't control their finances, what does he control? Yeah, well, well, they don't, uh, they don't look at, well, they have, they're not giving themselves over to him and putting him first. You know, tithing, is a faith and an obedience issue because he tells us in his word to put me first, give me back the 10% that I've given you. And he, now, and I, 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 we talked about this a little bit Sunday and Monday too, and my mission that there's more windows in any house than there is in uh, than is doors. When he said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing, you wouldn't have to receive. And I even relayed my experience, my walk of faith, to put him first and pay my time because I knew uh, the church has to be supported since somehow. You have salaries to pay. The church building itself has to be upkeep, uh, upkept. You know, if there's maintenance to be done, that has to be done. And uh, if, if there's some repairs to be made, it has to come from somewhere. And this is, a, a, and I'm taking the time, and I know him, you can relate to everything I'm saying, because you've been in, in the pastor all these years, a whole lot longer than I've been preaching, but I've been teaching and walking for, what, 45 years now? Because I started well, real I never, early. I never talked about giving. To me, uh, the, the 
if you don't give if you don't give a certain if you don't give the tithe you're robbing god to start with well so, that's I mean, true you, yeah if you don't if you don't give god 10 percent is already god's I, I think giving 10 percent is being cheap but <laughs> <laughs> but that's my but but giving should be a privilege it should i told one guy he he said uh how come have any of you given to God until it hurts? I said, that's ridiculous. I said, why God didn't ask us to do that? Yeah, why, why, does, why does it have to hurt to give God what belongs to him? If it hurts to give it to God, then you must be, it must be somebody else's money you're handling and God is in control of me. No, you know? that's right. I agree with that. But you know, I, I, I the person that told you supposed to give till it hurts, that's not what God asked you to do. <laughs> And he said, yeah, that 10 percent, all of it belonged to him because he is our source and everything else is our resource. He gives, he doesn't ask us to give him something, give back him what he had not given us. So if he gives me $10, 10 percent of it goes to him, doesn't it? Well, you know, right. you talking to the baby Christians sometimes and they haven't learned how to, they haven't learned that aspect of their life, you know? You know, that happened. And and let me say this. And, and I, I, just, I looked at my life. I was always taught to give. Sure, being a kid in the South, my parents would give me whatever to put in the church. And then they would give me my money weekly for the month for the for the my money for the week. But they always on Sunday morning gave me money to put in the church. So I grew up on this, uh, with the knowledge, uh, you supposed to put this in the church. Okay. But as I grew and toured and went on through this, grow up and both Christian and age-wise, I understood that you had to give God his. And I'm gonna say, and the reason I said it was a faith book, because sometimes, and I do believe that you are, we are tested when it comes to our giving. And if you got Discipline enough. I said, Lord, I'm gonna give you your money, and you have to make up the difference or, or fix this emergency that I have. And then I had to take it. It goes into us managing our money. And when I got to the point that I don't write anybody a check until I give God His ten percent, and everything falls in place. But each time I got out of line, I learned a lesson, and my faith grew. By saying, Lord, I don't, I messed up. I don't have it, but I'm going to make the sacrifice and give you yours. And, I, and I'm going to see what you're going to do. You know, that's, I, my faith grew from that. And I was disciplined enough to say, okay, whatever is coming. And that's to this day, I pay everybody once a month that are on the before. On a certain day of the month is what I'm trying to say, okay? The first of the month, I sit down to pay everybody. And I always, it took me a while to get all my bills to be due on the first of the month. So when I pay everybody, God first and everything else, well, I'll always have a piece of money coming in. Okay. And I agree with you 100% that our younger Christians, our younger young people, does not understand or they're not accepting the fact that we have to be disciplined in our personal finance. They don't understand living by a budget. I have had that class with these folks once before we had a discussion and they feel like one, they said a lot of these young millennials, they'll feel like the pastor shouldn't get paid. Well, who do you call? When you have a problem, who do you call when you need to be prayed prayed for? Who sits up there and get you ready for Sunday, get the message ready and uh, the studying and all? But that's their that's their mindset. They don't feel like the pastor should get paid. And I just said, okay. And then they that's well, you get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> There's a group that feel that when you put money in the church, you're giving it to the pastor. That's not true either. The past, if he, if he or she's getting a salary, they're getting a salary out of the income from the church and from tithes and all. That's what the pastor get. But I, I was, and I had to sit down and go just back through this tape. 
what are you saying now? There's upkeep for the church. There's expenses for the church. If it has a mortgage on it, it's due every month, whether you feel like the pastor getting paid or whatever, that has to be paid. The lights and it, all the utilities has to be paid. And I try to explain to them, it's like everything that has to be paid in your house, your personal house, has the same bills that goes on for the church. So, but see, uh, what I found out, Henry, was this. A lot of uh, the Christians take the church as a detachment from them. You know, I said, it can't be. Because this is your spiritual house where you assemble every Sunday morning. And if you don't, pardon me? Spiritual, that's the, sign the significant. Being a Christian is a spiritual experience, not mechanical. The, the mechanical has its place, but uh, the mechanical ought to be controlled by the spiritual. Exactly. And, then, and until they can get that concept, this is your spiritual house. Uh, the rest of it, the mechanical or the organization or physical organization part of it is going to be hard to penetrate that part. They have to get it on the spiritual realm uh, of, of who is. When it tells you here right here, we are the church, the visible church is a congregation. Well, baptized believers, they have accepted Christ. They should uh, have some spiritual discernment of what they are in. It, the church is a twofold organization. But some of them don't, they say, they say, oh, okay. And to me, that's the head part of it. It has penetrated deep in our soul and understanding of who is the true church is every believer. And doing so, we has a responsibility to the physical structure, the spiritual structure, our own spiritual house, ourselves, because we shouldn't stay babes in Christ. We need to grow in Christ. We need to. but And we also have a, a, a responsibility, a personal per Christian living, how we're going to treat one another. And I and I, I went to this last week, but I, that if we don't have a good re vertical relationship with God, how can we have a good relationship with our fellow man when he says very, very plainly, love, the first command is, what? Love me with that total being. He said, mind, body, and soul. Then love that neighbor, as I said. So you can't have a horizontal relationship that's with others, I felt, until we get us um, an established relationship with God. And, and they, some, so many is, is not getting that concept, not getting that concept. So what I want to do today, we, we talked about what we talked about, uh, given a, a, a thorough overview of the, uh, the first three components of the basic covenant as it relates to our church or the church. Okay. So what I want to do the next 30 minutes, it won't take me 30 minutes, is to talk about as to do this to fellow members. Okay. Now, let me see if I can do this, Henry. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, yeah, he's maybe going to let me do that. Okay. Can you see? Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I can't read any, but that's all right. You understand. Oh. <laughs> okay. You I, I listen. So. You listen. so you listen very well, huh? Okay. I have you... to. Okay. It's a subject I... for seeing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Now, I am. Uh, we was started here, and we're talking about the duties to a fellow member. Okay. And it says, Further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress. Okay, let me go here to First Peter 1 and 22 when it says to watch over one another in love. And let me see what Peter. Let me see what Peter said. 
First Peter says, First uh, Peter one and twenty two. It says this, and I, I like to take people to the scripture because we have some folks listening from over in Africa, and they may they, I know they may not have the articles of faith, uh, and I know they don't have the book that I'm teaching, so I read it to them so that they know that I'm coming out of the scripture. Okay, verse 22, verse Peter 1 and 22 reads as follows. Seeing ye have purified your soul and obeying the truth through the spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So this supports what I'm saying that we are to love one another. And it goes back to an earlier statement that I said, well, it's gonna be difficult for us to care about our fellow member or man if we don't really love God, because it, it, it flows from there. So now I'm not saying that please don't, I know that didn't misunderstand. God loves us unconditionally. He, he's, he loved us when we, was a wayward, hard-headed child. He, he really did I'll make it bigger. Okay. So, therefore, we are to love. We are commanded to love. And uh, let me say this, and I've been around in church a long time, and I'm sure you have too, that you can see. <laughs> uh, 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see that many in the church will talk about one another as even before they get out of the church. That's not brotherly love. That's not, if a person of your fellow member is having a problem, go to them and talk to them in love and see what you can do. But uh, in James five and six in the sixth phrase, second phrase that we are to pray for one another. And that's out of James 5 and 16. And it said we are supposed, if there's a, somebody sick among you, uh, pray for them. And if whatever physical aid that you can do for them, do it. Don't be standing offish and saying, well, they shouldn't have got in there. Well, if they sick, they need some help. We all go have some sick days. I used to hear my mother say, sick day is coming. And you need to prepare for when that sick day is. And what she was referencing is uh, she was teaching me budgeting. I didn't recognize it at the time that if you make a dollar, give God his and save some. And her exact phrase was, if you make a dollar, save a dime. So and therefore, when the sick day comes, you will always have some. And if you do good to others in your well days, somebody will always be willing to come back to you, to come to you. And she used to use this phrase, you reap what you sow. When you do good, good gonna come back to you. And if you do evil, evil is coming back to you. It's just that simple. So, and all I'm saying is here is that, yes, we are to pray for one another. And we're really, and, and for self too. So it's, our prayer should not be selfish, just on us, uh, my, on myself. I said it that way. Okay. Now, and what I said in the first letter, to aid in sickness and distress. When a person, we don't know what, what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't even know who we're going to need tomorrow. You might be up today and be down tomorrow. And if the way society is going, it might be the same day. You never know. So, and I, I, I love to live by this phrase. Do all of the good that you can for as long as you can and for as many as you can. There's John Wesley some... said that. Huh? John Wesley. Said okay. That. Yes. But it is, it is, it's, it's very true that if we is always giving and doing for somebody, we will never be in want or without because it comes back to us. 
you get back what you send out. Now that is a, a very true phrase, okay? Now, let me see here. It says, first Peter three and eight. Let me let me get over here to Mr. Peter. Uh, first Peter three and eight. And it talks about cultivating sympathy and courtesy. Now we're still talking about our duties to our fellow man. Uh, verse Peter 3 and 8 says this. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassionate one for another. Love as brotherly, be pitiful and be courteous. He said, listen, and it ties in this, the second commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself. When somebody is in need, have compassion and be willing to do what you can do instead of saying, well, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why they're in this situation. I don't know. But you know what I've noticed in this, in this country? That when there is a disaster, the outpouring of love, kindness, and compassion, that we see that. And let me say this. Uh, when this football player had a cardiac arrest on the on the football field and he had to rush into the hospital and it's known he was about over with the prayers that went out and the outpouring of prayers and kindness that went out to that that young man and you know what I said Henry in my mind why can't we all have that show that kind of love and, and compassion every day for one another why it's not that difficult. This, <laughs> yeah. And I think he, uh, and I've I heard, not think, that he was uh, for some charity uh, for, for, for kids. And they had, last count, they had raised over $8 million in his honor for the, his charity. That's love and compassion. You know, we are commanded to love one another. And I and I this scripture tells me this, and it's in John. And he asked the question, How can you say you love your fellow, you love God whom you never seen, and then hate your fellow man? Something is wrong with that. And I'm paraphrasing what John said when he says something, I'm saying something is wrong, but he tells us, No, you're not telling the truth. And it would be difficult for you to say that if I'm I'm I, I just like my fellow man. For what reason? What has it done to you? And even if they've done something to you that you don't like, we are supposed to forgive them and go on with it. You know, because we all have been forgiven as we were once sinners and God get, forgave us. And he constantly forgives us because we do something that's out of his will and, he, and we go to him and ask him, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And when I look at David in the Bible, King David, yeah, God said he was a man after his own heart. And I don't doubt that he was, because what God says is true. But David made several mistakes, big mistakes, but he repented and went to God and asked for forgiveness. Why am I saying this? Because we are not perfect. And when we harm somebody, be willing to forgive them. And if the person asks for forgiveness, that's what I meant to say. And if uh, we are harmed, or you and I are harmed by an, uh, one of our fellow men, be willing to forgive them and call it a day. And I'm not saying you have to go back and be buddy-buddy with them. I'm just saying but we are, we are commanded to forgive. Forgive? Forget about it. I'm going on about our business. Okay. All I'm trying to say is all of that I'm pointing out here as the church, we that we are talking about our duties to our fellow man. And if you see, if you look at from all, and I have one more, that we is all undergirded by love. And it, it is it is really based on God's love for us, all that He done for us was undergirded by his love. 
how can we, well, that's not the right question. So I won't ask. <laughs> but, uh, God gave his, be afraid. God gave his only son to pay our sin debt out of love. That's what I was trying to do and didn't get my question form. Okay. And let me go to this last one. It talks about reconciliation. We are to be slow to take offense, always ready for reconciliation. Now, let me say this. My mother used to teach me about uh, not being so quick to get angry, angry, or uh, uh, she would say hot tempered, or uh, fly off the handle is what one of her favorite phrases. Don't be so quick to fly off the handle. This was to be slow to take offense, but always be willing to for reconciliation. And that we find that in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verses 30 through 32. If I can get over to Ephesians. Doo, 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 doo. Uh, well, I can't find it, and I won't spend all evening talking about it because I want to close out today's discussion with the last one. Uh, but nevertheless, that's what it's talking about. Let me see. Here we are. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. And all I was going to do is read it for us. Oh, shoot. Ephesians 4, 32. Here it is. Found it. And be kind, be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That solidifies what I was saying about don't get mad at everything somebody says that you don't like. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, but in, in a re reconciliation, and it's going to take me into Matthew 18 about um, settling the disputes in the church. So many of them don't understand that, don't, don't know that, and don't practice it either. And I know you may have heard of it, uh, Henry, is that when there has been disputes that was not settled according to scripture and ended up in the court system. And here, oh, yeah. yes? Yeah, I know you're talking about. Yes, goodness. Uh-uh, uh-uh. So let me get to Matthew. Because uh, I, I, uh, that's why I've marked it. Matthew, the 18th chapter, yeah. verses... 15 and 16, and, I, and I'm reading it uh, so that the hearers, you know this already. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him as his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, Thou hast gained the brother. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Okay. Now the 17th verse says this. And if ye shall neg neglect to, if he shall neglect to hear them, then tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto them, thee as an heathen man and a publican. And, and the reason I brought this out is because there has been many unreconciled differences in our churches. And it calls a rift in the church. That's not what scripture says. Now he does it. Um, 
<laughs> when we do things according to the scripture, we'll be better off. As opposed to saying, I think or I do, I feel, what does the scripture say? If we're going to obey the scripture, the whole Bible is there for our benefit. And we have to determine in ourselves that I'm going to obey the whole scripture and not the part that's easy or the part that I like. Okay, that's nice that. Now, I'm going to this last one here, the last section of the church covenant. When it talks about, it says, we moreover engage that when we remove from this place, this local congregation, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Now, why why do why do we think this is a rhetorical question? I I'll stop sharing my screen right here. And we uh, now that is, and he said, people change churches all the time for different reasons. And if we and I'm and that's hopefully I'm not making a judgment, but to saying if you are in Christ and once you leave your local congregation where you are for a reason, and it says, make sure as soon as possible, unite with some other church so you can carry out the spirit. And I see that as being twofold that you will not be out of fellowship or the forsaken uh, of assembling with fellow believers. We do not want to give Satan an opportunity to try and filtrate our minds with negativity because Satan is always on his job. He is always trying to destroy our relationship with God and and, and that's why and, but that's why I, that's why not I but the covenant encourages us when we leave our local congregation make sure as quick as we possibly can unite with another church okay now I have walked that walk and, uh, but it wasn't a good one. I was only out for a year, but I was under the covering of my home church. And I was serving as a dean in Christian education at another church for about six years. And things began to go sideways. Not so much between me and the pastor or the congregation, but I saw the church going down here because of other situations that was out of order, let me put it that way. The pastor himself was getting ill and the way they were gonna try and bring in a new pastor was out of order. And I didn't wanna be in the middle of confusion. So I just stepped back and said, okay, and I had to take my time and pray and go in fellowship with God and, and prayer and communication with God. What do I do? Go side that, that last paragraph. If I'm going to leave the back and go back home or I'm going to find me another church, you know. And I finally went back to my home church until God moved me to where I am now. Okay. Case in point. I did not want to be out for ways today that we shouldn't have been, but I did not, neither did I want Satan to creep in. And neither did I want to be in the midst of the confusion and the chaos that was going to, that were going to and did pursue that follow after the pastor had, had stepped down and passed on. He couldn't service anymore. It split the church wide open. So many left the home church, had been there for over 50 years. And you're talking about hurt. So Henry, this goes back into when we talk about uh, settling our differences 
according to what God says. Okay. Um, this is kind of, I'm kind of ending this at this point. So that's where we are. Next week, we're going to start to take on the next uh, article. article of faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Baptism and the Lost Supper. Okay. Henry, I, I thank you if you got some comments. Uh, and then I'll ask you to close us out in prayer, if you don't mind. Well, I don't say anything, but I, I think, uh, I think, uh, I don't I don't usually operate under a church covenant, you know, because uh, I have a different system. But I really I think they're important because people need to know if they don't read the Bible, at least with the church covenant, they know what their responsibility is. See, right. and mm -hmm. it's, and the whole thing of being a Christian is a spiritual matter. It's That's my true. relationship with God, you know, and mm -hmm. and I don't need it when I understand the scriptures and my relationship to God. I don't need a church covenant. So that you, you see what I mean? When the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying some people need it because they don't read the scriptures and they don't understand the Christian life. So a covenant has a purpose, you know, and uh, but I think we need to grow to the part in our understanding of the scriptures and our relationship to God where we're not controlled by a covenant, but we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And and all, all the things you say in your church covenant are all covered in the scriptures. They're all our responsibilities as Christians, you know. That's true. But so many, so many new members, or even some of the older members, and I'm telling you this from my own knowledge and experience, they do not, they read this covenant when the, some churches have stopped reading the covenant, but the covenant is there for them to know how we're supposed to act. We are in a covenant relationship because it said being led by the Holy Spirit. We are in a covenant relationship with God. Sure. And as like I said, everything we come out of, come out of those scriptures. And like you say, if we don't obey the scripture or don't know the scripture, we're lost. Yeah, what do you they have? Don't, uh, they, don't, okay. they don't know their, what their responsibilities are, their duties are. They don't know how to treat their fellow man. And I'll go back to something I said. Or they treat the church as a detachment from them, and it should not be. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Do you want me to close with prayer? Yes, would you please? Okay. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he lives within us, and he guides us, and directs us, and helps us to understand your word. And Lord, I pray for these people who are part of this church that they will see beyond the covenant to see that being a Christian involves all these things. Yes, it does. And we pray, we pray that you will just take these words tonight and just help them to realize that these are not just rules and regulations. They are things that we delight in doing because we love you. We pray that you will take these words and make them a blessing to people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. This concludes our Bible study.